Yeah. Uh, I first I want to thank Dr. Sunil Deshmukh who invited uh, me for giving this talk. In fact, before this, he has already interacted with me for the last three four years, particularly from the lockdown time in 2020, where he invited me to write book chapter, uh, particularly on fungal peptides. So. Uh, in my CV, when Dr. Bellesh and I was reading that I had authored or co-authored uh, four book chapters, out of four, three are actually invitations from Dr. Sunil Deshmukh. So thanks to him, without his invitation, I would not have been possible to write those three book chapters. Interestingly, all these, th all those three chapters are uh, related to fungi, fungal products, and predominantly peptides, and some of them are non-peptides. So thanks, Dr. Sunil Kumar Deshmukh, and thanks, Dr. Shenoy, uh, for uh, arranging this uh, webinar. Uh, now let me share the screen to start my presentation. And after some time, I will close my video so that the connection is OK. So I hope uh, my screens are shared and I'm turning off my video. Can I just go to the full present? Yeah, I will go to the full presentation, full screen window. Yes, please. Is the full screen appearing on the screen? Yeah, perfect. It's perfect. Okay. Thank you. Turn off my video and I hope my voice is okay. If any problem is it, please let me know. Otherwise, I do not know what is happening. Yeah, we will let you know. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So the title of the my today's presentation is an overview into molecular structural properties and biological activities of fungal peptides. So I will not be talking much about the fungal organisms, uh, but I'll be focusing much on the molecular structures, which are actually derived from fungal organisms. There are some unique uh, structures uh, which are obtained from fungus, which you would not get to see from other biological sources. So I would be highlighting it. Uh, I'm not going to present any of my current research work. These are all already uh, published work and many of them are already available in the literature. So I'll be highlighting only some aspects, particularly with regard to the fungal source. And then uh, to say that how structure is important in influencing the activity. I am sure many of you already know the importance of uh, structure in uh, influencing the biological or medical activity. So. I'll be focusing only on the structural aspects and to some extent on biological activities. Now, before I go to the technical part of my talk, I would like to first acknowledge uh, Professor M. A. Vijayalakshmi, who is a founder director of Center for Bioseparation Technology, VIP Velu, where I have been currently working for the last about 11 and a half years here. And uh, the current director, Professor N. S. Jayaprakash, uh, also I would like to thank because he permitted me to make this presentation. And of course, and I should thank Chancellor, Vice Chancellor, Registrar, and other uh, management staffs of BAT Vedo because of which the institute is functioning smoothly. And uh, the, uh, the, my sitting place is somewhere in the building on the right hand side, which is now in, uh, indicated with an arrow mark. So that is the place where we sit and where our lab is situated and the CBST is situated. So before uh, proceeding to the molecular structural properties, let us see what are the medicines or drugs that are already available in the market particularly of fungal origin. Now, uh, there is one very popular drug called sand immune uh, sold by uh, Novartis, made by Novartis. Uh, it is actually a cyclosporine capsules. The active ingredient in this case is the cyclosporine. And cyclosporine is actually a fungal derived uh, molecule. And not only that, uh, cyclosporine is also available in the form of a syrup, which is again uh, made by Novartis in the trade name is Sandimium Neo Neoral. So this is given in the form of an oral formulation. And if you go to Drug Bank uh, website, uh, cyclosporin, the further details about cyclosporin can be obtained. It is also sold uh, uh, in other brand names like Sequa, Gengraf, Restasis, in addition to Sandimium and Neoral. Its main function is actually uh, immunomodulatory. It is a very frequently prescribed drug for people who are undergoing organ transplantation, particularly heart, liver, and kidney. So that uh, those who are receiving the transplants, the recipients, they don't uh, reject the uh, newly derived, newly grafted organ. 
So this is very frequently used in hospitals, particularly in organ transplantation uh, surgeries. Not only that, it has a lot of inflama uh, uh, inflammatory uh, related uh, uh, diseases it can be used and also for autoimmune related diseases it can be used. Now there is also ophthalmic solution uh, of cyclosporin which is given uh, for people who are suffering from keratoconjunctivitis, people particularly they have very dry eyes. So these are some of the functions of cyclosporin. It is also antifungal agent actually. Now, another drug that you can see in uh, pharmacy shops is uh, Cansidas. It is available in various dosages. It is particularly uh, prescribed for intravenous uh, infusion. It's a solution and it's given for intravenous infusion. Uh, it's the major ingredient here is caspofungin acetate. It is also a fungal origin. And in addition to it, it is sold in different uh, brand names like uh, Candidal, Caspoactive and Uficap. So they are all different brand names, but the active ingredient is actually Casper function. Uh, I want to know whether the mouse uh, cursor movement is observed on your screen, Dr. Rishana? Yes. OK, thank you. Another, uh, 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 another uh, notable uh, antifungal agent of fungal origin is mycofungin. Uh, this is also given for intravenous infusion, uh, mycamine. Mycamine is the active ingredient. Uh, so. So these are, mycamine is a brand name, I'm sorry. So these are some examples of uh, drugs of fungal origin. So if you want to know about further details about caspofungin and mycofungin, you can go to drug bank and then get all those details. It is, uh, both of them are antifungal agents and they are prescribed very widely, particularly to treat candidiasis and aspergillosis. So uh, these are the major applications. Now, the point here is why, uh, why I have selected uh, these drugs when there are so many available in pharmacy there are many actually if you go to drug bank itself you will get thousands and thousands of drugs now the reason to choose these is because they are peptides and this talk is about peptide that is one thing and more importantly you can find these drugs that is cyclosporin mycofungin caspofungin and fungin which have been included in the world health organization model list of essential medicines this is a 22nd list released by WHO in the year 2021. So today I did not know because I was searching yesterday. I couldn't get the current updated list, but this was available. It is You can download it in the form of a PDF file and go through it. And if you go through it, you will find these drugs are included as essential medicines as uh, from WHO. Now, according to WHO, essential medicines are those that satisfy the priority healthcare needs of a population. And they are selected with due regard to disease prevalence and public health relevance, evidence of efficacy and safety, and comparative cost effectiveness. So this is mentioned in the WHO website for these list of essential medicines. So I thought that I will choose these uh, as an example for today's presentation. So having uh, known that these are actually peptides, now some of you might, might not be having a clear idea that what are peptides. Because many of you might know DNA, RNA, and proteins. But when it comes to peptides, there are some uh, small confusions with regard to the size and uh, the length. So many people already know that peptides are actually nothing but shorter version of proteins. So sometimes people even call it as mini proteins. But uh, if, if, if we have to give a cutoff value based on the length so that peptides and proteins can be distinguished in a clear manner, then based on the length, we can have an cutoff value. So peptides largely refer to uh, those molecules which are composed of around 20 or 30 amino acid residues. So you all already know that proteins are made up of amino acids. So I don't have to go into those details. So peptides actually they have approximately 20. Sometimes it can be 10, it can be 15, it can be 8, it can be 7. So they are actually the shorter uh, versions of proteins, but up to 20 or 30, you call them as peptides. But when the length uh, is increased uh, more than 25 or 30, then usually it is called as polypeptides. The very famous polypeptide that every one of you know is insulin. Insulin is a polypeptide which is composed of 51 amino acid residues. Another is adenocorticotropic hormone, which is 39 amino acid residues long. So proteins, of course, you all know very well. So some of the very well-known peptides are bradykinin, which is a neuropeptide. Uh, you can find it in uh, separated in brain, which is nine amino acid residues long, and angiotensin two, which you can find in plasma, which is eight amino acid residues long. 
so this is uh, so in my talk i'll be focusing mostly on peptides so i will not be covering much about polypeptides and proteins so this is the brief introduction to peptides now coming to the structure because this talk is about molecular structure so for those of you who are not comfortable in looking at structure i i, I thought of making this slide so this what you see here is actually a two dimensional representation of a molecular structure not the three dimensional structure of a peptide so i just randomly chosen a C, uh, amino acid composition uh, and then i have made this uh, structure it's a two dimensional representation molecular structure of a peptide so you can see uh, uh, like proteins it also has an amino terminus and it has a carboxyl terminus amino terminus is sh uh, shown with the light blue color shaded uh, on the left hand side and the carboxyl side is shown with the light green color shaded uh, on the right hand side. So the, usually the amino terminus is kept on the left hand side and carboxyl terminus is kept on the right hand side. That is the conventional or uh, followed all over the world to uh, show or represent the peptide. Now, another uh, uh, very uh, important feature of peptides is they will have a repeating amide units. So you can see here the which I have shaded with the uh, rose color, a cream, light rose color or light brown color amide units so it will have a periodic repetition of amide units uh in with intervening c alpha carbon so so you will find intervening c alpha carbon between the repeating amide units so you can also call it as polyamide but polyamide is usually the organic chemists uh, uh, they say they use a the terminology polyamides but biochemists and biologists and chemical biologists they use the word peptides okay now how the sequence is uh, uh, written so based on the side chain that is uh, linked to the C alpha carbon, uh, the, the nature of the side chain that is bonded to the C alpha carbon decides the uh, linkage, that is the sequence of the peptide. So shown here is the hexapeptide that is containing six amino acids, uh, S, G, A, D, M, F. That is the single letter code of the amino acid and the three letter code is also shown here on the, by the, side, the structure. So this is just a brief introduction about the structure of a peptide because in the forthcoming slides you will see many structures uh, and I would like to highlight how fungus makes very different type of structures which which are very difficult to actually synthesize in the lab and which are also very difficult to imagine sometimes right now since there are so many structures of peptides known it's always better to classify them now th there are many ways uh, classification can be done shown here is one uh, classification based on the structure or architecture so not all peptides in nature are actually linear so what do the structure that you saw in the previous slide was actually a linear structure so you had a free amino terminus and you had a free carboxyl terminus free means that is it is not bonded to any other functional group or any other atom so but there are also in addition to the linear peptides you also have cyclic peptides which form a ring like structure and again uh, in the cyclic structure you can have different types of architecture based on the connectivities based on how different atoms are connected to uh, each other. So the backbone cyclized cyclic structures refer to uh, the atoms that they are, only the backbone atoms are connected. You will not see the side chain participating in the formation of the cyclic backbone. So the R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, R6 refers to the side chain and uh, they don't participate in the bonding at all. The side chain is free. So that's called as a backbone cyclic structure. It is also sometimes called as head to tail cyclic structure because if we consider amino terminus in the linear peptide as a head and carboxyl terminus in the linear peptide as tail, and if you connect the head and tail, then you get the cyclic structure. That's why it's called also called as head to tail backbone cyclic structure. Another way a cyclic structure can be formed is only the side chains can participate in the bonding, but not the amino terminus and carboxyl terminus. So how is it possible? Now, cysteine is, uh, many of you know about cysteine amino acid. Cysteine is an amino acid which has a thiol side chain. So thiol uh, is, uh, means it's a SH group. Now, when there are two cysteines or more than two cysteines in the peptide sequence, then if the fold is appropriate, then, then those two cysteines can come closer by, the side chains of those two cysteines can come closer by, and they can form a disulfide bond. So, when it forms a disulfide bond, as shown in the bottom left-hand side uh, structure, you can see that uh, a ring-like structure is formed. So this is also a cyclic kind of a structure. And since here the amino terminus and carboxyl terminus are not participating in cyclization, it is called a side-chain cyclized peptides. 
So there are many disulfide bonded peptides uh, without uh, wherein the amino terminus is free and carboxyl terminus free, and therefore disulfide bonded peptides are uh, form a special category of uh, cyclic peptides. Fourth, fourth category is backbone and side chain cyclase. That is, one of the atoms in the backbone can form a bond with one of the atoms in the side chain. Now, shown here in the bottom right hand side structure is the amino terminus uh, amino group forms a bond with one of the carboxyl groups in the side chain of another amino acid within the same sequence. So, you see, carboxyl terminus is free here. But amino terminus is not free because so the amino terminus is a part of a backbone and that forms a bond with the one of the carboxyl groups of the side chain. So that's why it's called the backbone side chain cyclase. There are also a good number of examples of backbone side chain cyclase peptide, but they are not many uh, compared to backbone cyclase and uh, disulfide bond atoms. So the category four, uh, the number of peptides are actually not many compared to other three categories. Right. With regard to fungal peptides, in addition to these uh, four different structural categories, you, you will find that there will be additional features because these four categories has been only made on a broad uh, way of uh, looking at it. But if you see the fungal peptides, it will have some more additional features, which I'll show in the next slide. So many of the pep linear peptides that have been isolated and studied and uh, uh, from fungus, what it has been found is the C terminus would not have a carboxylic acid group. Instead of a C terminus carboxylic acid group, it will have an alcohol functional group. You can see here CH2OH. Instead of C double bond OH, carboxylic acid, there is an alcohol functional group. So this is called a C terminus alcohol. And the N terminus would not be a free amino terminus. It would be modified with acetyl or any other uh, lipid uh, modification, that is, any other fatty acyl group modifying the amino terminus, which is indicated with X here the left hand side so the, these uh, this such kind of uh, structures you don't see in other organisms it's prevalently seen from the fungal uh, source which i will be explaining in the due course of time in this presentation other interesting feature of uh, fungal peptides is uh, cyclic dipsy peptides they are uh, here what i am shown is a backbone cyclized uh, cyclic dipsy peptide what are dipsy peptides Dipsy peptides will have an ester functional group, which is being shaded with light blue color uh, and indicated the red color arrow. Uh, so you see, this is an ester functional group, not an amide functional group. But you will also have in the backbone amide functional, repeating amide functional groups on the other part of the structure. So even if there is one uh, ester functional group present among the other, uh, uh, um, I mean, among the other functional groups then it is called as uh, cyclic dipsy peptides. So these two are something special about uh, fungal source. Of course, cyclic dipsy peptides are also uh, can be found in bacteria, uh, but they have a different uh, uh, structural character characteristics and fungal cyclic dipsy have a different characteristics. I'll be only telling about the fungal cyclic dipsy peptides in the later part of my talk. Now, now coming to peptide ball. So you can see here the name itself, peptide ball, it might be a little uh, new to some of you. Now, uh, why it is called as peptide ball? Now, shown here is a structure of a uh, very old and perhaps the first discovered peptide from uh, uh, peptide ball from uh, fungus called trichoderma, say in 1960s or 1970s. This was the first peptide ball to be discovered from trichoderma, I think 1970s, late 1960s. Now, what was found in this structure was there was at several places there was one unusual amino acid, which which you cannot find, which which you cannot bring it in the twenty genetically coded amino acids. Every one of you or most of you know that there are twenty amino acids which uh, for which you have a DNA and RNA codons. But here you see you will have an amino acid which I have shaded with green color, light green color. Uh, they they don't have a genetic code. And if you look at the structure and uh, just isolate that particular part and draw it separately, and uh, you can find that you can call it this as alpha amino isobutyric acid. I have shown the residue only here. And that is, I have removed the hydrogen and OH for clarity. And uh, so you see alpha amino isobutyric acid. 
which is uh, which you can also call it as a methyl alanine because in alanine if you remove one hydrogen from the c alpha carbon and put one methyl group then it becomes methylated alanine and when and nearly 50% of the amino acid composition of this particular peptide is composed of aib alpha amino isobutyric acid so uh, you see the once this was uh, found so it was called as ala methicin ala methicin actually put it in the reverse way methyl alanine so that's why it is called as ala methicin f30 is because of the chromatographic fraction 30 okay so that is that is why it's called ala methicin because of the presence of an uh, alpha amino acid butyric acid about 50% uh, of the amino acid composition is composed of aid and you look at the C terminus. In C terminus, there is no carboxylic acid functional group. C terminus is position I have in, on the slide, it's on the bottom bottom part, shaded with light blue color. And I have written it as phenyl alaninol. Now I cannot call this as phenyl alanine because it does not have a carboxylic acid functional group. It has an alcohol group. So that's why it is called as phenyl alaninol. The side chain is same as the side chain of phenyl alanine. Whereas the uh, it's not CO carboxylic acid, there is CH2OH alcohol. That's why it is called as phenyl alaninol. And its amino terminus, which is shown on top of the slide with the blue color arrow, it is the acetyl modified amino terminus. Now, looking at the structure, you can uh, some of you might who know who know about peptide and protein sequencing uh, might understand that sequencing such peptides is not possible by conventional N-terminal sequencing or Edmund sequencing method. Because to do Edmund sequencing or N-terminal sequencing method, there should be a free amino terminus. Uh, because a phenyl isothiocyanate, which is the Edmunds reagent, will first react with the amino terminus. And then after that, uh, it will keep on reacting with the subsequent amino acids in the peptide or protein. And the sequencing can be done. But that is not possible in the case of peptide also. So interestingly, if you look at the history of alamethacin, uh, this structure was actually uh, fully uh, elucidated by NMR spectroscopy. And of course, a lot of mass spectrometric uh, work also was considerably done. Uh, at that time, there were not much of development in the technology, particularly with regard to NMR as well as with regard to mass spectrometry. So most of that work was done with very low resolution NMR spectroscopy and also GCMS, gas chromatography mass spectrometry. And many times this structure was revised and finally the structure was uh, confirmed. That this is the structure that is so this i'm trying to say that some that the need for a suitable analytical techniques is also very important when we encounter such very unusual structures and many a times when we have worked with unknown compounds this becomes a problem uh, because we do not know whether it would have a free amino terminus or whether it would have a carbo free carboxyl terminus whether it is cyclic peptide so it is very important to keep these structural characteristics in mind so that in your research if you encounter such kind of structures you can be careful in making assignments with whatever data that you get from various analytical techniques. So that's why you see here, instead of calling this as peptide, of course, you can see repetitive amide bonds will be there. So you, that is there. So it will have the normal conventional features of a normal peptide. Normal peptide means the repeat the amide bonds should be repeating periodically. That you can see in the structure here. So retaining the PEPT, the first four letters of peptide, and because this is rich in AIB, a, introducing AIB in the middle, and because the C terminus is composed of not not made of uh, carboxylic acid but uh, alcohol, taking OL from alcohol, so a new uh, word was uh, coined called as peptide ball. This is a separate class of peptides, and this you can see I think 90 to 95 percent only from fungus. As far as I know, there are no reports of peptide ball from bacteria and there are no reports of peptide ball from plants as yet. I mean, I may be wrong, but I am very confident I can say that majority of the peptide balls are actually from fungal sources. Right. Now, what is so special about peptide balls? Uh, peptide balls are actually having the properties of altering the membrane permeability. So, they can go and insert into the cellular membrane, the lipid bilayer membrane. They can go and insert. They have the ability to go and insert. Because peptide balls are largely hydrophobic. If you see, because already it has uh, more alpha amino isobutyric acid, so which is a more hydrophobic side chain. It will also have prolines. It will also have alanine, glycine, valine, phenylalanine. So it's a more composed of more hydrophobic amino acids. So 
so because of its uh, large hydrophobic nature it has the ability to enter into the lipid bilayer membrane of the cell of the cells and in doing so what it can do is it can allow the cations for example sodium or potassium or calcium to move across the membrane in doing so what happens is the osmotic balance is lost because the osmotic balance is lost the cells would die so this is one of the mechanisms of peptidols having its antifungal activity or its antibacterial activity there are many mechanisms uh, 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 many mechanisms uh, through which the antibacterial antifungal activity uh, different types of other drug molecules and other molecules do but peptidols do it in this manner they don't actually rupture the membrane they actually go and sit inside the membrane by so that the lipid bilayer slightly gets expanded and then why because you can see here a few peptidol monomers approximately 6 to 8 molecules they aggregate leading to formation of a pore like structure through which the cation translocation is facilitated so this mechanism has been well studied uh, in the 1980s in professor balram's lab uh, so which i have cited here in the bottom of the slide and further studies in professor balram's lab have also shown that they are uncouplers of mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation so so the uh, in the mitochondria many of you many uh, of you who would have studied biochemistry or uh, know that oxidative phosphorylation is an important step in the aerobic respiration and that ha that takes place in mitochondria of the cell and because they go and interrupt uh, this particular step they stop this aerobic respiration and in that manner they also have this antifungal or antibacterial activity so this uh, the structural aspects related to this particular mechanism of uh, uh, sitting in the membrane have been thoroughly investigated in 1980s so coming to peptidol research in india now the reason why i chose peptidol research in india is if you if you go do a pubmed search or google search today you will find new numerous peptidols even uh, which should have been published in the previous year 2023 or 2022 so it's not possible to cover everything in 45 minutes or one hour talk so i thought i i thought i will only show some of the things that particularly which have been carried out in india in fact uh, when dr sunil kumar deshmukh invited me in 2020 uh, to write a book chapter uh, he he was telling me that why not focus on some research that has been carried out in india so this is actually we have written all these things in the form of a book chapter uh, after after getting the invitation from dr sunil kumar deshan the same uh, almost the same thing i am showing in this talk for those people who did not have the opportunity to read the book chapter so you can get to know some of the highlights of that particular book chapter now actually the peptide of research in india was started by dr mj tirumala achar in hindustan antibiotics limited in the 1960s uh so uh, i if i am correct hindustan antibiotics limited was somewhere near mumbai or in pune today it is not there uh, and uh, and it so happened that later it was continued by professor balram uh, after 1975 1976 so late 1970s and it, it went till approximately 2012 the peptidol research was carried out in professor balram's lab so if you look at uh, his uh, research studies which spans for about nearly 3 decades uh, say from 1976 to 2012 with regard to peptidols he had characterized both natural peptidols as well as synthetic peptides in fact to start with in late 1970 synthesis was done because at that time the hplc technology had not developed very much in 1960 uh, 1970s or 80s so synthesis was one way of uh, uh, getting these peptides in a little bit easier manner because in order to isolate these uh, peptides you need to do several rounds of hplc purification which is very time consuming but synthesis can be easier compared to hplc purification so initial part of his research was focused on this embryomycin fragments alamethicin fragments suzuka cell in fragments the purpose of the study was to know how these molecules are able to insert into the cellular membrane so basically uh, he was using uh, that's why i have written here ion channel forming activity studies and mitochondrial uncoupling activity calcium transport activity so those studies were done using synthetic fragments in the beginning but whenever the opportunity was there to study natural peptidols that also was uh, done then uh, four natural peptidols were structurally char characterized by nmr spectroscopy and x-ray diffraction 
that is the antiamibin, zervamycin 2b, zervamycin 1c, lu zervamycin. These four natural peptide balls, which were HPLC purified, and then later on kept for uh, uh, later on kept for crystallization. So those structures were all solved by X-ray diffraction as well as by endomass spectroscopy in solution. With regard to X-ray diffraction process, Balram had a long-term collaboration with Dr. Isabella Kahl in the U.S. And then, uh, uh, I mean, if you go through the literature, you will get uh, uh, papers on this anti-amibin, zervamycin 2B, zervamycin 1C, and 2 zervamycin in collaboration with Dr. Isabella Kahl. Now, all these are peptide balls. So you can find uh, that how the structures are, uh, uh, how the amino acids are oriented in the structure. And you will find all these peptide balls would have having considerable uh, uh, number of uh, alpha amino isobutyric acid, this AIB. And uh, in, in the later part of uh, uh, the later part, uh, aphropeptins also was studied in the lab, and also trichotoxins were studied in this lab, and trichogit A4 synthetic fragments were studied. So this is actually a nutshell uh, of the work related to peptide balls carried out in India in Professor Baldram's lab for a bit spans for about nearly 20 to 30 years. So the, the la after 2000, it was mostly on uh, mass spectrometry characterization uh, because by then the mass spectrometers were available uh, compared to what it was earlier before 2000. So uh, ephropeptins, trichotoxins, they were all st also studied by uh, mass spectrometry. Right, coming to ephropeptin, ephropeptin uh, is something special uh, because uh it is if you see its structure its c terminus does not have a alcohol group uh its c terminus has a bicyclo structure you can see at the bottom of the uh, slide here it is not an alcohol group it's a bicyclo amino group uh and then if you look at the n terminus it's, it's a uh, it's an acetyl modified n terminus and why it is even more interesting is because you can find Further, uh, non uh, even in addition to this alpha amino isobutyric acid, two other non-proteinogenic amino acids. That is, you don't have a genetic code for that. You see, pipacolic acid, the six-membered ring, another pipacolic acid, uh, which is indicated with red color arrow. So another uh, pipacolic acid. There are three pipacolic acid residues are there, and one beta alanine is there, which is shown with uh, another uh, purple or pink arrow. So you can see how unusual these structures are. Now, these structures, it's not possible to be formed from the conventional uh, ribosomal machinery, like you get have DNA and then RNA from RNA, you get proteins, and then the proteins get processed to get peptides. They don't form in this manner. So the mechanism of this biosynthesis is entirely different, and this is characteristic of something fungus. fungus. Of course, bacteria also do it, but bacteria uh, contains different kinds of other structures. So, so there are some structures which are very unique to fungi. Now, its, it's source is from Tolipocladium niveum. It's shown here is actually ephrapeptin C. There are many other ephrapeptins, other A, B, C, J, up to J. Uh, you can find, if you do a literature survey, you will find there are many other ephrapeptins. I have just picked up ephrapeptin C and then shown here. And what is its biological activity? Its activity is it inhibits mitochondrial ATPase. Uh, and then it also inhibits photophosphorylation in chloroplasts. So you see it has... Uh, 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 implication so even if it, so if any fungal pathogen uh, is there for plants for fungal plant pathogens so this is one of the way it can be attacked now since this particular peptide does not have a c terminus alcohol group you don't call this as peptide ball so this is called as peptide biotic like how you have antibiotic so this is called as peptide biotic now AIB is still kept here because you, you see the green color shaded regions uh, are AIB. Now again, in this case, about 40 to 50 percent, around 40 percent of the total amino acid composition is composed of AIB. So that's why it's peptide biotic, peptide biotic. So this is something a uh, little different from peptide ball, but still it can be uh, com uh, it can be kept closer to the peptide ball class of peptides. Right. Now, in the previous slide, when I was showing ephrapeptin, I was telling that I, am, I was only showing ephrapeptin C, but there are other ephrapeptins like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, I was saying that. Uh, but when I say that, what does it mean is there are actually uh, isoforms. I mean, in protein, uh, in the context of protein, people call it as isoforms. And some of you might already know that isoforms are because of uh, an event that takes place 
uh, which is called as RNA splicing. But here, you here there is a thing like RNA splicing. But still, you will find microheterogeneity. Microheterogeneity means if you look at the sequence very closely, uh, only one or two or three or four amino acids in the sequence would be differing between one peptide and another peptide. So, for example, take alamethacin one F thirty, which is uh, whose sequence is shown on top of on top. And then take uh, the sequence of alamethacin F50. If you look at these two sequences, instead of uh, the E glutamic acid at the C terminus, near the C terminus, you have a glutamine Q. So the mass will differ by one unit. So that's why uh, in the alamethacin F30, the mass is 1963.1, whereas alamethacin F50 is 1962.1. And then another thing is alamethacin 2. If you see here, alamethacin 2 at the sixth or seventh position, one, two, three, four, five, sixth position, you can see that instead of alanine, there is alpha amino acid butyric acid. U is actually uh, used as a code for alpha amino acid butyric acid. Uh, but but uh, recently, uh, this U is now being questioned uh, that uh, U should not be used as a, a symbol to represent alpha amino acid butyric acid. So some other symbols are being suggested. But I am retaining the old uh, single letter code for alpha amino acid butyric acid for this particular talk. Uh, so you see, instead of alanine, there is alpha amino acid butyric acid. So what happens is the mass will increase by 14 mass units because it's a methylated alanine. A is alanine, U is methylated alanine. So mass will increase by 14 mass units. And then the glutamic acid at the, near the C term is the same. So you can see here 1963.1, 1977.1. Right. So, with, so these sequences, uh, uh, are called as microheterogeneous sequences because very small differences, but you will see significant difference in the mass. So if if you want to know whether the microheterogeneity is there in your sample, mass spectrometry is one way to characterize it. The, the, such microheterogeneity sequences may not be clearly observed in HPLC HPLC purification. In HPLC it might appear as a single peak because very small changes. You may not get the another uh, peptide as another peak in the HPLC chromatogram. They will co elute. It's called as co elution. But even though they co elute, you can distinguish them based on mass because of significant difference in the mass, like 14 or 15 mass unit difference. So sometimes you uh, you should uh, you should not uh, decide or conclude that when you get a single peak in HPLC chromatogram, particularly in this particular uh, peptide research. A single peak doesn't mean that it is a very pure uh, fraction. So it can have more than three or four different types of molecules. And maybe microheterogeneity is present in that single uh, peak fraction. So that, that point should be kept in mind. Right. So is it true only in alamethacin microheterogeneity? No. Microheterogeneity is also observed in the case of trichotoxin peptidol sequences. So trichotoxin is another class of peptidols. Which is, uh, which is also uh, isolated from trichoderma species. Aramethis is also from trichoderma. And this uh, trichotoxin sequences have been reported not only from soil fungi, but also from uh, marine fungi. Uh, so here, if you see, I have taken uh, five different trichotoxin peptidol sequences. But you see, the masses are very close. Uh, very closely differing. So in this case, even the even the mass spectrometry cannot be useful to distinguish them. And such such sequences, it, it's not it's not possible to separate them by reverse phase HPLC very accurately. It will appear as a single peak or very once some small shorter peak might appear, and and you cannot collect collect it very uh, precisely. So we can distinguish by mass spectrometry. Otherwise, we can distinguish it by tandem mass spectrometry, where we can fragment and look at the fragment M by Z values. And then find out at which site the microheterogeneity is present. So in this case, you can see at second position, uh, the alanine is uh, changed to galanine, uh, glycine. In the second sequence instead of alanine, you have glycine. And in the fourth, and the, uh, uh, whereas in uh, whereas in the other sequence, the last one uh, the same. It comes back to alanine. Second position is again occupied by alanine. And uh, Another one, what you will see is alanine getting changed to U, alpha amino acid butyric acid. And you will find one more letter called J, which you will not find in the 20 
I mean, a single, uh, single, uh, I mean, 20 single letter codes of 20 amino acids. Now, J is used to represent another non proteinogenic amino acid called isovaline. So, you see, isovaline has a different structure. Uh, it is not same as valine. Because in the valine, you will uh, the you will have uh, C in the, the branching will start at the C beta carbon atom. On the side chain, the branching will start. Whereas here, the branching starts at C alpha carbon atom itself. So these are something which is very unique to fungi. Isovaline, I don't think you can find it in bacteria or plants. So so you might wonder what is the use of it? The use is because they the fungi uses this for defense purposes or for uh, antibacterial purposes to, for uh, for other uh, uh, biological purposes so and what it has what has been found is uh, when compared to l isovaline d isovaline has been found to be more in uh, number in peptide balls compared to l isovaline so the stereochemistry is shown on the right hand side the left hand side it's not a stereochemical notation is not shown just for the clarity and uh, in the right hand side, you can see that the stereochemistry is shown, which is D isovaline. L isovaline also is found in peptide balls, but compared to that, D isovaline is more in number. So, so this is uh, one thing uh, micro heterogeneity is one thing which you can find very frequently in peptide ball sequences. And this has been found not only from trichoderma, from other fungus also, not only from trichoderma. Right. Now, uh, with regard to this, during my PhD time, I got opportunity to work with trichotoxin peptide ball sequences. Uh, and what we found was, uh, we actually we actually encountered this kind of a situation because we did not know uh, when we got a HPLC fraction and we wanted to analyze it, we did not know whether it was having one peptide ball or two or three or four or five. We only knew that the mass is around 1717 or 1718. So we had to do fragmentation. And from the fragmentation, it was possible to find that there are actually three different peptide ball sequences. And to understand the fragmentation pattern, we used some synthetic peptides before studying the natural trichotoxin peptide ball. And the synthetic peptides uh, studies were uh, useful to interpret the natural peptide ball sequence. And eventually, we published it in rapid communications in master parameter. So being in Professor Balram's lab in, during my PhD time, so I got an opportunity to work with this trichotoxin peptide ball sequences right now so far i have showed you about peptide balls but i have not told you much in detail about this two amino acids i only told you that this is non proteinogenic amino acid that is alpha amino isobutyric acid and isovalin so some of you might be wondering or you want to question what is this alpha amino isobutyric acid what is this isovalin of course i told uh, these are non proteinogenic amino acids but what is non proteinogenic amino acids why uh, how they come into the peptide sequence so let us now look into the biosynthetic pathway very brief biosynthetic i'm not going into the details very very uh, because time is only 45 minutes to one hour it's not possible to cover a lot of details regarding biosynthesis because biosynthesis of peptide was itself is uh, now emerging to be a very important very interesting area particularly with developments in molecular biology People are now trying to even change the sequence of peptide balls in the lab, uh, the culturing and the doing molecular biology work. So, how these amino acids are uh, getting incorporated into the peptides? Right. Now, to understand that, uh, we have to know about non-ribosomal synthesis. Now, you see the word non-ribosomal synthesis. That means the ribosomes are not involved. So, you might be wondering how ribosomes are not involved. Because usually ribosomes, as you have, many of you know already, that ribosomes are actually sites of protein synthesis. That is a place in the cell where all proteins are made. Then how come these peptides are made? So the thing is, uh, peptide ball biosynthesis, not only peptide balls, even other peptides from fungi and also bacteria, they are made from an enzyme called multimodular enzymes, which is shown with a light blue color uh, having uh, different uh, segments connected by uh, which are connected one to other that is each and every segment light blue segment corresponds to a particular domain each and every domain has the ability to pick one amino acid and then uh, join with other like how you know trna does it in a similar way here it's not, i am not i'm not comparing exactly with trna i'm just taking analogy with trna uh, 
tRNA synthetase or tRNA protein. So in a similar way, here uh, we have multimodular enzymes. These are actually enzyme complexes. It's a huge enzyme complex. The, the masses of these enzyme complexes are in mega daltons, not in kilo daltons. They'll be 1.3 mega daltons or 2 mega daltons. So huge enzyme complexes. And they, these enzyme complexes all uh, have multi mod multi domain. You can even say multi domain enzymes or multi modular enzymes. And each and every domain will have the ability to bind to one particular amino acid, and then they'll stitch one amino acid with other, and then finally you get the peptidol. And there'll be one domain which will be responsible for the formation of C-terminal alcohol, and one domain which will be responsible for the formation of uh, for the modification of N-terminus. So. So if, if you want to change the sequence uh, through the biological means or through molecular biology means, what one can do is if a sequence of, uh, I mean, you can play with the DNA sequence through molecular biology routes and then get a different type of multimodular enzymes. And then you can find whether that gives different uh, peptide sequence in the end. So since, they are, since these peptides are not directly related to the ribosomal uh, ribosome, they're indirectly made because through it, it has to go through this multimodular enzyme uh, strategy. They are called as non-ribosomal peptides, NRPs, non-ribosomal peptides. And these enzymes are also called as non-ribosomal peptide synthetases, NRPSS. I have not written it here, but they are called as non-ribosomal peptide synthetases. They catalyze the formation of non-ribosomal peptides. And that is why these peptides are also called as secondary metabolites. So they are not primary metabolites, they are secondary metabolites. And you see depsipeptides, cyclic peptides, cyclic depsipeptides, peptide balls, they are all peptide secondary metabolites. And, and I have also written here non-proteinogenic amino acids. So here, because these non-proteinogenic amino acids, they bind to one, one, one of the modules. So they are not guided by an mRNA codon or a, or a anticodon, the tRNA or DNA codon. So they are actually... Uh, they will go and bind to this non-proteinogenic amino acid will go and bind to one of the domains in the multimodular enzyme. So that's why it's got us non-proteinogenic amino acids because these amino acids you don't find regularly or not at all in proteins. That's why they're called as non-proteinogenic amino acids. Sometimes people also write it as non-coded amino acids because they don't have a codon. So this is in brief about these non-ribosomal peptides. In fact, today's talk, uh, predominantly I am only showing non-ribosomal peptides. Right now, going uh, all these all these uh, things we have actually summarized. Uh, uh, not summarized. I'm sorry. We have written elaborately in this book chapter uh, when I got invitation from Dr. Sunil Kumar Deshmukh. You can see his name is here. He's one of the editors. So this was published in 2021. Uh, I mean, I wrote with the help of uh, Professor Gurunath in IIT Kanpur. So this contained much of the research carried out in Professor Balram's lab, uh, particularly with regard to peptide balls. So for further details, you can go to this book chapter and uh, get to know more details regarding this. Now, going to next uh, topic, which is cyclic peptides. Cyclic peptides, uh, today, if you see in the literature, I have, uh, I mean, today, maybe even more. But when I saw a review article uh, in, uh, uh, say, one year or two years ago, I got this paper from a journal called Molecules 2017. They say that there are approximately 290 fungal cyclic peptides are there. So, and uh, where, uh, most of them have been reported from Aspergillus, Penicillium, Fusarium, Acrimonium. Of course, other species are also there, but majority from these four fungi. So you can see it's, uh, 290 is not a small number. So diversity is so huge. Of course, here actually they have excluded cyclic dipeptides. That is two amino acid containing cyclic peptides they have not considered in this particular review. From three up to 10 or 11, they have covered in this particular review. And there are also cyclic peptides which have been reported from psychrophilic and psychotolerant fungi. That is which live in extreme environments, like very cold environments like Himalaya or uh, Arctic and Antarctic zones. So they, even there, some fungi are able to grow. And uh, people have found some unusual cyclic peptides from such uh, from fungi collected uh, growing in such extreme environments so i will be highlighting a few examples in this particular section cyclosporin which i showed in the beginning of my talk which has immunosuppressant suppressant activity uh, i told that is uh, sand immune and the neoral from novartis 
So look at the structure of cyclosporin. So it is actually a cyclic undeclopeptide. That is, there is 11 amino acids actually are uh, there in this cyclic peptide. Now, what is very interesting about this structure is, you see here, out of 11 amide or peptide bonds, seven of them contain methyl group. You can see here, I have highlighted with the red color arrow at seven different locations and uh, uh, six, I mean, one I have highlighted with pink color circle. So they contain a lot of N-methylated residues. So I mean, normally people don't, I mean, when you work, when you say proteins or peptides, normally people say NH. Nobody thinks about N-methylate, isn't it? But n methylate presence of N-methylated amino acids is a very common feature in fungal peptides, particularly cyclic peptides. So you see, uh, such kind of peptides you can encounter in any in, in, in your research also, perhaps. So you see N-methylated residues are there. And at, this is whatever I'm showing the structure in this slide is actually taken from drug bank accession number uh, from this particular drug bank, actually cyclosporin A, I think. But today, if you see in the literature, 26 different analogs have been reported, natural, 26 natural analogs of cyclosporin have been reported. Okay. Uh, from more than four or five fungal species. For example, first time cyclosporin was reported from Tolipocladium species, but uh, later people have discovered cyclosporin in Fusarium, Aspergillus, Trichoderma, Buberia. So, so it's not only uh, not not just one fungus produces this molecule; several other fungus also produces this molecule. That means it means that it has it really has an important uh, biological value and already I have told you it's a very frequently used uh, as an immunosuppressant drug, particularly in organ transplantation surgeries. Okay, so this is a structure, it's a cyclic peptide. It's a it's a non-ribosomal peptide, and that's why you have this N-methylated residues. Right. Now I also showed you in the beginning uh, about cancidas and mycomy. What about that? Now those peptides, they are, they are also cyclic peptides, but actually they are not natural they are not fully natural they are partly natural and partly synthetic what do i mean by that partly natural partly synthetic what does it mean is when people were working with fungus like uh, this glaria lozoensis they got uh, they got a cyclic peptide called pneumocandin b naught uh, and when when biological activity studies were carried out for example in vitro or animal model studies they found that it, it was having some uh, uh, problems like toxicity uh, or adverse effects and therefore they were trying to do some mutations in the fungi and then saw that it was possible to get a different kind of a cyclic peptide which has a less toxicity better efficacy and less adverse effects so sometimes what they do is after isolating the peptide you can also do some chemical modifications on them uh, so largely it will be from na biological natural source, but you do some small, small modifications, but, but carrying out the small modifications will be helpful in making them more safe and also making them more efficacious. So for example, caspofungin acetate, uh, it, it's, it's natural precursor peptide is pneumocandin b naught. Mycofungin, which is sold as mycamine, it's natural precursor peptide is FR901379. So this, this is the first isolated peptide naturally. Later on, a lot of chemical modifications are done so that it can become a drug. It may be bioactive, but not all bioactive molecules become a drug because they may get withdrawn at some stage during the preclinical trial or clinical trial. So different types of modifications are carried out. That's why they are called a semi-synthetic peptide, not completely synthetic peptide. And uh, anidula fungin, so it's from echinocandin B, from aspergillus. Okay, and today there is one drug called Rizafungin. Uh, it's still not released in the market. It's still in the phase three clinical trials. And you see, for Rizafungin, I, I have put natural precursor peptide as Anidula fungin. So, what people have done is they have done a very small modification uh, to Anidula fungin, chemical modification, and by doing so, they find that that the new Rizafungin is even more efficacious. So. This is how pharma companies do. Uh, uh, sometimes they follow this semi-synthetic strategies, not completely synthetic. So, and then uh, they improve its uh, properties, biological properties, and make it drug. So you can see, Cancidas was really, all all these four are antifungal. All these four are antifungal. They are from fungus, and they are having antifungal activity.
so you can see this cancidas was released in 2001 approved in fda in 2001 and europe 2002 and later uh, mica fungin 2005 in fda and 2008 in europe and anidula fungin approved by fda in 2006 so now risa fungin is currently under phase 3 clinical trials so that's why the source is not written because it's just taken from anidula fungin right now uh, i'm sorry i, I when i skipped to one slide just a few slides are there yeah yeah. Yeah. So, echinoclantin class of drugs. Now, why uh, this echinoclantin class of drugs is important? Because when you know that, see, uh, already there are a lot of antifungals that are available in market. For example, uh, azoles, many azole derivatives or amphotericin B, they have uh, antifungal activity and which have, which you can see in pharmacy shops also. But uh, at the same time. The resistance also is developing towards these kind of small molecule drugs. So one of the motivations to actually uh, why peptide drugs are still being persisted. Many times people say that peptide drugs do not uh, are not very successful because when it enters into the uh, gut or uh, it gets hydrolyzed and uh, therefore it doesn't go to the site properly and therefore they are withdrawn at a preclinical stage or clinical stage. But that's why many times it's given intravenous and all those things. But actually, it's not the case. Uh, when there is more and more drug resistant strains are getting developed, peptide drugs are actually more safe. Because it has been found that this echinocandin class of drugs is found to be effective even in azole resistant strains. Why? Because the mechanism of echinocandins to show this antifungal activity is different from the mechanism of azoles. How? What is the mechanism? Because echinocandin class of drugs, they actually target the biosynthesis of beta 13 D glucan. So beta 13 D glucan is actually found uh, in the fungal cell wall, which is about 50 to 60 percent of the fungal cell wall, which is actually absent in humans or absent in animal cells. That is beta 13 D glucan is unique to fungal cell wall, and it's present in Candida and Saccharomyces species. So if the beta 13 d glucan biosynthetic pathway is targeted then the fungal then the fungus can be killed so which, that is what echinocandin class of compounds do that is the cancidas myca mycamine anidula fungin so they actually target the biosynthetic pathway of beta 13 d glucan whereas the azole and amphotericin they are they don't they, they don't show the antifungal activity through this mechanism so so even though a particular, uh, even though azole resistance strains can be there, if echinocandins are going to be tried, they can, there is another way of uh, inhibiting or killing the pathogenic fungi. So you can see here, fun they are fungicidal against several fungi, including candida, and this fungi is static against aspergillus species. So that's why the name echinocandin is given because uh, they are inhibitors of biosynthesis of uh, beta 13 d glucan. Right. So let us look at the structure of caspofungin, which I showed uh, in the in the during the initial part of my talk. I showed the caspofungin, uh, which is available in the market. So it is actually a hexapeptide. You can see a cyclic hexapeptide. That means six amino acids are there. And you can realize that this is a non-ribosomal peptide from the various unusual modifications that you see. These amino acids, you don't find it in normal proteins. Even, uh, of course, there are uh, post-translational modifications that can happen. But post translate modifications, uh, the groups that come due to post translate modifications are different from the modifications or the amino acid structures that you see here through non ribosomal synthesis. So it, its natural precursor peptide is pneumocandin B0. Uh, and what is the difference between pneumocandin B0 and caspofungin? Uh, the the circle, uh, whatever uh, portion that I have shown by dotted green dotted circle. The only those two portions are actually modified compared to pneumocandin B0. So in pneumocandin B0, uh, if these two groups are modified, caspofungin can be obtained. And then it is also called a cyclic lipopeptide. You see, because there is a large hydrophobic uh, hydrocarbon chain present on one of the side chains of the, of this peptide. Not only that, you can find some unusual uh, other unusual amino acids like hydroxyproline. So you can see, you know, some of you might already know what is the structure of proline. You can see here, this is hydroxyproline, hydroxyl modification of proline. 
there is another proline shown in blue color there is hydroxyl modification of proline in, and another modification is tyrosine you can see here it's actually normal it's not a normal tyrosine it's actually a beta or homo tyrosine because tyrosine should come where tyrosine is the one where the phenol ring should be linked to the c beta carbon but whereas you see here the phenol ring is bonded to c gamma carbon so you find a different kind of tyrosine here now this is uh, so actually the, the reason why the i have shown the red color uh, homo tyrosine and the blue color uh, hydroxyproline is because uh, is because in the case of mycofungin and in the case of anidula fungin as well as in rhiza fungin these three amino acids are fixed that is the homo tyrosine and three hydroxyproline uh, sorry not three hydroxyproline hydroxyproline uh, are also present at the same positions in the case of mycofungin rhiza fungin and anidula fungin so which means that they are required for its medicinal activity so then uh, what they do they, so they actually vary the cyclic lipopeptide so in the case of uh, mycofungin or anidula fungin this cyclic lipopeptide would be modified to some other hydrocarbon group maybe by introducing double bond or adding, adding some more functional groups or the groups that i have shown by green circle that would be changed to some other uh, group to see whether the caspofungin can be made even more efficacious or it can be made even uh, less toxic or to improve uh, its efficacy, efficacy because sometimes some drugs have to be given at more frequent intervals uh, maybe it will have a very less half life in plasma so but if you make some very small modifications in the structure it can increase its lifetime in plasma and if the if the lifetime of the particular structure increases in plasma then the frequency of dosage can be decreased and thereby uh, its efficacy can be improved so that's why these uh, regions I have uh, highlighted in the caspofungin's molecular structure. So next cyclic peptide which I want to show is actually it has not come to the market. It's still, uh, I mean, only the bioactivity has been reported. I do not know what is its current status, but it's very interesting. So I thought of showing as one example. Because you see here, it has anthranolic acid. That is, you see a benzene uh, ring as part of the backbone. Uh, which is very rare uh, in, in the case of cyclic peptides. And you see, this has been reported from marine derived halo tolerant aspergillus pyrotiorum. So, this is called an anthranolic acid, and this is a very rare amino acid that is found. Uh, and, and you will see that it will it'll have all the features of a normal peptide. You see, it will have a repetitive amide bonds. Uh, you, can, you can just see COnH, COnH. It will have the normal feature of other, uh, I mean, a normal cyclic peptide, repeating amide bonds. But at the same time, you see the side chains, some unusual features you see. Another unusual feature is dehydrotryptophan. Now, you see here, usually the, the bond between C alpha and C beta carbon atom in the amino acids, in normal 20 amino acids, there will be no double bond. Okay, The bond between C alpha and C beta carbon atom, it's a normal single bond carbon carbon single bond but here you see it's a carbon carbon double bond so there are even reports if you go through the literature regarding this peptide there are even reports studies where people have done some photochemical reactions whereby they change the orientation about this double bond and seeing whether it has some other activity or not how the structure varies because of shining light on this particular structure so you can you can go through the further details regarding this it's from aspergillus clearotai or a marine derived one sclerotide A. There are other sclerotides are also there because as I told, microheterogeneity is a common feature of non-ribosomal peptides. So in some in some places, some amino acids will be replaced by another amino acid. So you'll get sclerotide B, sclerotide C, sclerotide D, etc. Et so this is a, another example of a cyclic peptide. Some of the sclerotides have also shown to have some cytotoxic activity towards a few cancer cell lines. So this has some implication to uh, anti-cancer studies. Now, what are cyclic dipsy peptides? I think I, I can take another five to ten minutes, Doctor Shenoy. Another five to ten minutes. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. Cyclic dipsy peptides. So, as I told, cyclic dipsy peptides will have at least one ester functional group amidst the other normal amide uh, groups. So, this was again reviewed well uh, and published in the year two thousand eighteen. Uh, from the same group which had published about cyclic peptides in 2017 from China, the same 
people have published this in 2018. And they say that there are about 350 fungal cyclic, uh, sorry, it should be dead cyclotides. Uh, I didn't correct this. So it should, uh, there are approximately 350 fungal cyclic depsy peptides. And you see, uh, the list is actually a little bigger than what you saw in the case of cyclic peptides. So now a new uh, species that are introduced in this case is Isaria, Bivaria, Metarhizium, and Alternaria. So these are the fungus uh, which produces cyclic depsy peptides. Now, Cyclic Dipsy peptides have a, can be classified uh, in three different ways because, because now there is an ester functional group getting introduced in the backbone of the ring structure, uh, which means that a hydroxy acid is getting incorporated in addition to the normal amino acids. So there will be several amino acids, but um, among several, one or two more, two hydroxy acids can come and combine and form the cycle. So uh, it can be uh, there, there were some definite patterns that were found uh, when I was going through the, the 300 uh, structures of cyclic depsy peptides. I could see a definite pattern. The pattern is some cyclic depsy peptides CDPs have only one alpha hydroxy acid. Some have more than one alpha hydroxy acid, and whereas some have beta hydroxy acid. So it is possible now to classify based on the hydroxy acid structure. You can classify in these three, three categories. So according to structure also will be different. The final result and structure of a peptide also will be slightly different. We'll be having different geometry. Uh, so actually the CDPs is not only uh, found in fungi, even in bacteria CDPs are found. One very famous CDP that I have some of you might know is valinomycin. So valinomycin is very popular because if you look at the valinomycin structure, it has a very interesting pattern. The pattern is you will see alternating ester and amide bonds. It's a hexapeptide, if I am correct. That is six amino acid, six residues will be there. Three of them will be hydroxy acid, and three will be amino acid, and they will be joined to one another in an alternate manner. So you will have one ester followed by an amide, then followed, then next ester, then followed by an amide, then next ester and followed by an amide. So that is one very popular uh, uh, example from bacteria. And valinomycin is an ionophore. So it also has the ability to insert into the cell membrane and then allow the ions to pass through the cell membrane. So, see, so, so here I'm talking about CDPs and fungi. So you can see here uh, varieties of uh, examples. Actually, I only listed a few. I already told you there are 350 CDPs are reported, but I have only picked up some and I'm showing it to you. Now, uh, among this, I would like to highlight Isaridins and Isarens, because during my PhD time in Professor Balram's lab, I got the opportunity to characterize Isaridins and Isarens by mass spectrometry as well as by the mass spectroscopy. So that's why I've included here. Isaridins have alpha hydroxy acid only, and uh, Isarens have beta hydroxy acid, but not alpha hydroxy acid. So a question arises: What are what are they? So the next slide I'm showing you the alpha hydroxy acid containing CDP and beta hydroxy acid containing CDP. So what you see on your left is, uh, you can see here only one ester. Uh, of course, here I've shown you alternating uh, alternating uh, ester and amide bonds. Not, uh, uh, this is not one alpha hydroxy acid. This is alternating uh, hydroxy and uh, amide things also. Because you have an ester and you have a amide then you have an ester and then you have an amide then you have an ester and you have an amide so this is alpha hydroxy containing more than one alpha hydroxy containing cdp and here you see a beta hydroxy acid what is the meaning that see you have a ch2 extra in the backbone which i have cycled circled with a green color dotted line you can see here one extra ch2 and then only you find a o coming here and you find a ester linkage whereas remaining you all will have an amide linkage so you see the structure, it's a little different. So, so these are uh, the characteristic, I mean, these are some of the interesting features of CDPs. And uh, this is one of very old uh, study, uh, which we published in Journal of Natural Products, as I got an opportunity to study from the fungus ice area. So they produce both of these CDPs, one containing alpha hydroxy acid, another containing beta hydroxy acid. In fact, isoridins also have a beta amino acid. So, and what is so special about these uh, CDPs? Now, these CDPs were found to have 
inhibition act, inhibitory activity on plasmodium falciparum. So that means that they have application towards developing anti-malarial uh, compounds. So it's not it's not that uh, I mean it, although this is 17 years old uh, uh, study, but even today if you see cyclodexapeptides or cyclic peptides from fungus, you will find uh, at least two or three studies uh, on cyclic dexapeptides or cyclic peptides showing variety of activities, including uh, inhibitory activity on plasmodium falciparum. So even though it is old, still currently it is still people are reporting such kind of structures. That's why I told you that the review published in 2018 today. Nearly 350 CDPs are known, so which means it's uh, it's not actually old. So the research is still continuing. Right now, all these uh, CDPs and cyclic peptides are summarized in the another book chapter. Again, thanks to Dr. Sunil Kumar Deshmukh who invited to write another book chapter. So this chapter was only uh, not about peptide balls. So in this chapter, we wrote only a small section on peptide balls, but we wrote other sections on cyclic peptides and cyclic depsy peptides so the, so for further details you can go through this chapter which was published in 2023 and uh, recently in this year uh, again thanks to dr sunil kumar deshmukh so uh, and we have uh, published another book chapter now here we have included non peptide drugs also of fungal origin in addition to the peptide drugs so in this book chapter we have Described about the caspofungin, mycofungin, that is the echinocandin class of drugs, rizafungin, anidulafungin. So those details are published in this book chapter. So uh, with this, I end my talk because I think one hour is complete. Yeah, approximately one hour I have taken for 50, 55 minutes, okay, and I stop here. And, and this world is, I mean, the fungal peptide world is actually very huge. It's not possible to cover it in 50 minutes. But I have just highlighted some of the structural features uh, of this fungal peptides in this talk. And thanks uh, for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sabrish. I, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, yeah I can yeah. hear you. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, insightful presentation on fungal peptides. Maybe you can stop presenting now the slides. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, Go to Chrome. Uh, yeah. Great, great, great. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, let me start. Uh, we'll have kind of a question and answer session. Yeah, yeah. yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe for 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, but uh, considering our the considering our Microasia community and Micro India community, we normally have around 20 minutes of a QA Q &A, Q &A session. But let me start with my simple question. You know, you know there are lots of uh, Taxonomists, uh, people who study diversity of fungi, who are ecologists in our community. I'm talking about Micro Asia community, Micro India community, even for that matter, AFP community. So uh, we are having kind of a dialogue with the chemistry people, and we are trying to find out uh, where should we look into to plausibly get some novel antibacterials for the benefit of the world. What do you uh, think? Right. I mean, from whatever I have read uh, so far, based on that only I can say so because I am not a mycologist. Uh, one is marine fungi because that is not explored compared to soil fungi. Soil fungi has been studied extensively because soil is very easy to collect compared to marine uh, uh, sources. Another is endophytic fungi which grow on plants. So these two, I, in my opinion, these two are the areas where future can be particularly to get very unusual structures and unusual structures will have unusual biological activity. So. I mean, unusual, it should not be uh, uh, adverse effects, but unusual should be beneficial medicinal effects. So, yes. let, let me just supplement my question with you. Do you think the fungi who live in very extreme, anthropogenically extreme conditions, they probably could be a potential yeah. source of a novel antibiotics? Yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe that's uh, correct, correct. Hot springs, hot springs is one. Uh, as I said, Himalayas. So in, the, in 2020 and 2021, maybe three, four years ago, from CSIR uh, in, Institute of in, uh, Integrative Medicine, uh, Jammu, yeah. uh, uh, from Dr. Ram Vishwakarma's group, which we have written in our book chapter also, uh, they have reported peptide balls from Himalayan fungi. Now, they say that that fungi is endemic to Himalayan regions. And because their institute is in Jammu, they have the access to collect soil samples there. And they were uh, reporting uh, 
pepe balls which are different from the pepe balls that that have been characterized in professor balram's lab and uh, they have reported cytotoxic activity against some cancer cell lines so uh, this extreme regions like himalayas or uh, hot springs and marine marine areas like coastal areas of bay of bengal and arabian sea so there may be some interesting places to look on maybe andaman and nicobar coral reefs uh, that is another place you can look for yeah thank you very much dr subesh for that answer and uh, we will consider yeah. we are may yeah. ask a small question yes okay yeah yeah uh, dr varadarajan it's a wonderful talk that you gave okay. and uh, i'm very pleased although i'm not a chemist i just work on fungi and uh, very interesting observations i made from your talk that uh, many of these fungi which produce these peptides you know they are all very simple fungi like aspergillus penicillium fusarium okay fusarium acrimonium yeah. bruaria metarhizium isaria all these isaria. are very simple, yeah, yeah, very simple. Yeah. simple you know yeah. tolipoclidium um, that some species you referred nevium Mm. it was earlier called as fusarium vas infectum nevium oh okay and uh, this was actually watermelon wilt fungus oh okay it was causing watermelon i think it was reported earlier as a you know pathogen on watermelon okay now very simple fungus it was originally it, if you look at the fungus under microscope it is a very simple uh, how to say um something like an acrim one anyway doesn't matter but those simple ones are the ones which are actually producing these very interesting you know pep, um, molecules on cyclosporin all those yes. things yeah. so one area for search is to these simple fungi which are in your backyard yeah Don't in that, uh, well, since, yeah i would know. like to uh, interrupt sorry for interruption yeah but but i am interrupting because from the point that you said it was i agree with you completely in fact the isaria that i showed in the doc uh, is actually yeah. was isolated from a rat's dung so it's actually a coprophilus yes, yes, yes. coprophilus fungi actually correct several of the species of isaria are coprophilus you know so is from all angles you know the how this uh, taxonomy into uh, bioprospecting all these are interconnected only thing we have to work with the tandem yes wonderful it is i am very pleased with your talk and i wish you all the best thank you yeah, thanks yeah. okay okay thank you professor but dr sunil sunil shivastav please uh, hello yeah can you hear me sir yeah i am able uh, to hear you oh great uh dr sabarish first i must congratulate you for an excellent talk thank uh, you it's a very important topic these days when we are fighting mr and also antifungal uh, we are in death of antifungals uh my uh, point is uh, that as you also indicated we have been looking into the terrestrial fungi mostly mm -hmm. the soil fungi what is lacking is we haven't explored much of marine uh, fungi you know and yep. uh, that's an uh, a wealth gold mine of all these kinds of yeah. compounds yeah. Yeah. which are unexplored and also uh, very harsh environments that could also be one and endophytes so yeah. uh, uh, like tandem mass spectrometry is one but uh, are there any high throughput uh, tools uh, that we can uh, do in a very short period of time and a screen for such peptides uh, that could be of interest uh, i'm sure ai would be playing an important part there protein engineering and ai so uh, what exactly is the status particularly in india if we want to work on these compounds what exactly should be we looking for to right. add to our laboratory yeah. facilities yeah. yeah thank you sir very very interesting very nice question so i think is uh, based on the literature because you found that nearly 300 cyclic peptides have been known so far 350 cyclic dipsy peptides have been known so far peptide balls i forgot to mention during my talk more than 700 peptide balls are known uh, so my idea is since ai is also playing a very important role these days it's better to first build a database right and the database is well arranged based on the functional groups and based on the molecular features 
and uh, some of the molecular features we can also predict as a chemist we can also predict uh, and then keep them as a separate category in the database and record lot of tandem mass spectrometric data particularly lc msms data mm -hmm. and then have a platform whereby you can allow the lc msms data to interact with the database and uh, that will simplify the simplify means time taken for uh, analyzing the lcms data can be minimized but even for interpretation some of the unusual structures it will take more time uh, that's why i mentioned briefly about uh, techniques like x-ray diffraction nmr spectroscopy and the tandem mass spectrometry sometimes it takes more time to interpret the data because structures are unusual we don't anticipate that kind of structures but that will come to know a little later yeah. so the time consume gets consumed mainly because of the unusual structural features, even though the technique may be readily available. Uh, so sometimes we may have to change the method of the analytical technique. Uh, so we have to develop some new methods. But if it is a known, very well-known structure with less unusual features, then it should be straightforward. So developing a database and uh, uh, running LC uh, MS, MS can be one of the ways where you can save the time of data acquisitions and then save the time of data interpretations. So this is my yeah uh, so uh, the database is very very important as well yeah yeah uh, and i was also reading these swapping of the amino acids you know the positions can greatly enhance the potency of certain peptides you know so all that also can be possible only when we have a good database you know yeah yeah so when when that exactly also so my my last question is uh as far as the anti-cancer activity, because that's a huge market, and there is a big dearth of uh, such compounds, such drugs, because we are uh, depending on other modalities, which are very, very expensive. So uh, have you explored the, this aspect also, cytotoxic effect on cancer cell lines and things of those kinds? According to my literature survey, uh, cytotoxic activity studies using these fungal peptides have been very recent say last less than 10 years from now mm -hmm. uh, i could not find anything earlier say anything before 2000 or before 2005 okay. uh, after 2005 or after 2010 the studies on uh, cytotoxicity against the cancer cell lines have increased using these fungal peptides okay. in fact this himalayan peptide balls from dr ram vishwakarma's group from csir jam uh, triple im jammu they have done on uh, some cancer cell lines and showed that cytotoxic activity in micromolar range uh, uh, they have shown. Okay. Okay. Thank you once again. It was very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for this. Thank you, Dr. Srivastavji. Thank you so much. Sachin Rajput, please. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah, I am able to hear you. Yes, sir. Uh, sir it uh, some sometimes the target is inside the cell, so we need uh, cell penetrating peptides. So, is there any uh, 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 what is that called marker or uh, specific uh, characteristic in fungal peptides that can uh, penetrate cell? Uh, 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 yeah, your question is uh, very nice. I don't have an answer for it. At the moment, I can say that they can only alter the cell membrane permeabilization. But uh, but if if uh, something some other drug molecule, if it can be appended to the such kind of uh, peptide balls or any other peptides, and then hope that that particular whatever is a uh, particular group which is appended to it to enter into the cell after it goes and uh, 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 sits inside the lipid bilayer membrane, then it is possible. But otherwise, I do not know uh, how it can be uh, in, taken into the cells. So but that's a tough uh, thing to answer, but very nice question. Yeah, thank you, sir. Nice presentation also. Inspiring. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Sachin. Uh, uh, sir, Sajan George, you have any question? Ah, uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it was a great presentation and I learned a lot of things. Uh, it's a very new area for me. And in continuation with uh, the question from Dr. Sunil Srivastava, uh, I just want to know if, because a lot of these antifungal agents, uh, uh, these compounds and these peptides, they are effective against the fungus and uh, maybe yeast and mold, fungus, all those categories, all those, mm. all those yeah, uh, organisms. So is there any uh, antifungal peptides which could be effective against uh, bacteria? Uh, 
which can be potential therapeutic agents, uh, especially from the point of view of antimicrobial or antibacterial resistance issue. Uh, is this uh, antifungal peptides be useful to be uh, therapeutically effective against bacteria? Because we have problems with, uh, uh, with the bacterial uh, antibiotic resistance and all those things. So that's the reason I'm asking this question. Because I, I learned that uh, you know, this, some of these antifungal peptides have been used in anti-malaria, as anti-malaria agents, and also anti-cancer uh, has been like explored now. So is, is that useful to be used as antibacterial agents or antibiotics against bacteria? Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Hello, Dr. Sarinjad. Uh, see, uh, I do not know whether the antifungals can be uh, used as antibacteria, but there are many uh, cyclic peptides and fungal peptides which has been shown to have antibacterial activity. I have not shown that in my presentation. Uh, okay. So I have not shown in my presentation, uh, our... but uh, there are many antibacterial peptides out there. Mm, yes, because uh, because we have running short, we are running short of these antibiotics against bacteria because yeah 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 anti yeah. antibacterial resistance and all of these issues. yeah yeah and a lot of times these antifungal peptides are effective against a fungus itself or or candida candidas or uh, yeah I yeah I have taken such examples but uh, yeah. there are peptides which show antibacterial activity also so uh, okay all right yeah. okay yeah. that's good thank you so thank you so much yeah, thank, thank you Dr. Sarkin. thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will be take, we will be able to take up two more questions. First one would be, would be from Dr. Vivekananda Pandal. If you're there, Dr. okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah sir. So thank you, uh, Dr. Sarvadish. Uh, this is a nice presentation. Now I have uh, just small uh, submission to you. The how you can uh, uh, determine that my fungal extract or the bacterial extract could have some peptide in nature. Is there any way out? Because we are working on secondary metabolites yes. and most of the cases, these are basically small molecules. So yeah. is there any demarcating point that this, my extract could contain the peptide-like molecules? Right. Uh, good question, sir. Technical question. Right. Sir, uh, it is possible to do by mass spectrometry. Uh, uh, I mean, better to do a HPLC fractionation followed by mass spectrometry or by NCMS. And from the mass range itself, it is possible to know in, uh, can it have uh, can it be a peptide or a non peptide and uh, when you analyze the mass spectrometric data the isotope peaks can be sometimes helpful in distinguishing a peptide and a non peptide furthermore fragmentation uh, is necessary because peptide fragmentation is entirely different from a non peptide fragmentation so okay. the characteristics of peptide fragmentation uh, can, uh, since they are different from a non peptide so msms data can be helpful in distinguishing a peptide and non-peptide. Otherwise, okay. otherwise you can do some ninhydrin test uh, or something. But the problem with ninhydrin test is, since these peptides are unusual, we do not know whether we are we will encounter unusual structures or not. Yes. Uh, amino terminus will be modified, and with the modified amino terminus, ninhydrin will not uh, show any yeah. possible test. Yeah. yeah. So that is why uh, that is why this confusion comes. Uh, okay. TL, TLC can be done, but again, TLC, even a small molecule uh, can behave in the same as a peptide uh, uh, behavior. So, okay. so uh, best thing is to uh, do a MSMS fragmentation uh, okay. and then see whether you are able to get a fragmentation pattern that matches with uh, a peptide fragmentation. That's why I said about database. So if you build a database containing fragment ion M by Z values of peptides, they can be different from the fragment ion M by Z values of non-peptides. So okay. database matching can be very useful to distinguish them. But of okay. course, you should have a suitable mass spectrometer. That is a big problem. Can you use this uh, this uh, SDS page-like system for no, this? No, uh, no, sir. SDS page is not suitable for this. That's why I said start talking with peptides. In okay. the itself, I made a presentation that is going to be on peptides. So Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, one, one idea which I can suggest is you can run the centrifugal ma uh, cutoffs, mass based centrifugal filters, centrifugal filters. So there are different uh, mass based uh, centrifugal filters 10 kilo Dalton uh, centrifugal filter, 5 kilo Dalton, or 3 kilo Dalton. Yeah. So okay. after passing it through the centrifugal filters, uh, the filtrate, you can anticipate that they might have some peptides on there. No, regarding that is all our aqueous extract. Mm. Is there any solvent selections for the peptide preparation? Right. Or so from the agree. Agree. Yeah. agree. So you, if you, if you, you can try solvents like methanol, uh, ethanol, or uh, acetonitrile. 
sometimes even uh, combination uh, with the uh, two two more solvents or three solvents you can get it so okay. for aqueous extracts you can try uh, hydrophilic interaction chromatography hilic uh, okay. combined to mass spectrometry so okay. uh, in that case it can be done uh, so there is one thing called tricene sds page since you mentioned about sds page uh, i have mm -hmm. something like tricene sds page yeah that can detect less than 1 kt ah uh, yeah but that uh, that is, uh, that is difficult to do kg. because uh, uh, it, it may not be very reproducible tricene sds page okay 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 but very sir, good question you. sir yeah thanks for your question very good thank question. you thank you so much thank you uh, dr mandal uh, last question from dr arundhati sina if you are around madam ah uh, thank you sir uh, thank you for such an enlightening session i am a mycologist i have been working on biocontrol since the last 20 years so sir my question is that uh, uh, could you please enlighten us enlighten me on any anti anti fungal maybe cyclic uh, peptide which is effective on uh, basidiomycetes fungi uh no ma'am currently i don't have an answer for that because there are there can be many uh, so uh, but if you want to know uh, I mean, the literature that I have shown in my presentation, just check whether that can answer your question. Okay, sir. So there may be a trade name for it as well. Maybe, maybe. Okay, but thank since you. Since this literature is very vast, I cannot remember so many things. Uh, yeah. But it should but it should be there. It should be there. Okay, sir. I'll search once more. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Thank you. And last, uh, I'm tempted to just get that one question from the chat box. Uh, Dr. Vaishali Nirmalkar wants to know how many non-coding non-coding pipe peptides have been reported so far do you have any insight on this yeah yeah many uh actually i didn't say about one more thing because of time was there time was not there gamma uh, gamma amino butyric acid gaba uh there are peptides which contain gamma amino butyric acid uh so there are many aib is also there in cyclic peptides i showed only aib linear peptides peptide box but there are reports where aib is present in cyclic peptide uh, so there are many. Uh, GABA, GABA is one thing. Gamma amino butyric acid is one. Beta amino acid, already I told you, beta amino acid. So isovaline, ethyl norvaline. Ethyl norvaline is another unusual amino acid. So sometimes it's better to do amino acid profiling of this fungus extracts. And you see whether if you get some unusual amino acids. When you encounter such amino, unusual amino acids in the profiling, amino acid profiling, then you can expect that they can be included in the peptide synthesis also. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, uh, we must uh, stop the uh, question and answer session now. But uh, Dr. Uh, Sabrish, is uh, Sabrish is available on the email. I have already, already shared his email address in the chat box. Feel free to send an email to him if you have any more queries. He's a nice man. He will be happy to answer to your questions. Uh, final comments from Dr. Sunil Kumar Deshmukh, the President of Association of Fungal Biologists, please. Actually, I'm thankful to him for giving nice presentation. Thank you. And uh, as far as the molecules are concerned, when I was working with Hex and Pyramal, we were doing the activity-guided isolation. So whatever peptides are active, those we were working. We were not working with the peptide which is non-active. So one has to do that activity first and check it. Because if you are working with non-active, then people may not be interested. It will be of only academic interest. Yeah. This is one comment on the whatever person was asking about the peptides and peptides you can use different solvents but the limit when you are using the different filters that time there is a limit of solvent you cannot use 100 percent methanol or 100 it should be combination less than one of one or five percent and yeah. Yeah. at last i'm thankful to him for accepting the invitation and giving nice presentation particularly i was interested people should know about the peptides and particularly peptide bowls which people have less work in India in particular. Yeah, yes, Thank you. Sir. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Sudil, for inviting me and for considering my name and suggesting it to Dr. Shanoi. And Dr. thanks to Dr. Shanoi, who invited and made this presentation possible. Okay. Thanks. Then, yeah. and thanks for the audience. Thanks for the audience who participated in this. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you, you so much. Thank, thank you, you ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank. Uh, uh, Dr. Sabrish for his uh, wonderful presentation and uh, patient hearing of the questions and uh, answering them in a very nice manner and in a very 
very inspiring manner. I'm sure many of us are very much enlightened today with the wisdom, knowledge, and the information he has shared with us. Uh, we are grateful to you, Dr. Sabrish. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll keep in touch with you and yeah. we'll have more interaction. We'll have more talks in maybe the, in the same platform or maybe in a different platform. Uh, and I would like to thank Dr. Sunil Kumar Deshmukh. Uh, I would like to thank him as the managing editor of uh, Micro India Journal of uh, Indian Fungi for collaborating with the Micro in with Micro India and uh, uh, having this wonderful series of lectures. And I mean, normally I'm a fungal taxonomy, so I'm more into diversity. But the kind of uh, speakers we have had so far, wonderful, and uh, they have actually taken into a different horizon, actually. Thank you, Dr. Deshmukh, for uh, this brilliant idea of uh, taking taxonomists and diversity experts to the biotechnology space. Thank you so much. And our wonderful audience today, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, uh, we expected some 55, 60 people. They were almost there. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, as I told Dr. Sabarish, we might expect yeah, 55, 60 people. Some people came and uh, just left, but uh, most of the people stayed and listened to us, uh, listened to you and interacted with you. Thank you very much uh, to, to today's uh, audience. You have been very wonderful. We would like to have you again in the next week where uh, Dr. Uh, Sanjeev and I will talk about lichens. Uh, that will be under my Croatia Masterclass series. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, have a nice uh, Sunday, and uh, thank you for thank you again. Bye bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye.